Wow, welcome, and thank you so much for coming out on a rainy day in Chicago. Um, I am Heidi Heikamp. I'm currently the director of the IOP, kind of David too, but David came today because this is a very special um, visit for all of us at the IOP. Um, you know, I just want to first off say that we're so pleased that you could join us um, as we welcome Michigan, uh, Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer for a conversation with IOP fellow Kate Brown, the former governor of the great state of Oregon. You know, when I started in politics 30 years ago to have two governors uh, so prominently featured on a stage would not have been possible. And so we know every year things change in politics and change many times for the better. Before one of our students comes onto the stage to formally welcome our guests, I wanna share one brief pre, uh, uh, programming note. Due to the time constraints for today's event, audience Q&A will be a little different format from our typical um, uh, way we do Q&A. Um, uh, we will not have students line up at the microphone. Instead, Governor Whitmer will field pre-submitted questions that were sent in by those who successfully registered to attend the event. Please understand Governor Whitmer has not seen the questions in advance. And so I wanna thank you now for coming and for joining us and please Please welcome Jacob Gillian to the stage for a formal introduction, one of our great students. Thank you. Jacob, congratulations. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the IOP Speaker Series event, Politics, Policy, and Pragmatism, an hour with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. I am Jacob Gillian. I'm a third year here in the college. I'm co-chair of Spectrum, one of the student civic engagement groups here at the IOP. And perhaps most importantly, I'm a proud Michigander. It is my honor and pleasure. Yes. It is my honor and pleasure today to introduce my governor, Gretchen Whitmer. Governor Whitmer has proven herself to be one of the nation's most effective leaders. In her first term alone, she signed over a thousand bipartisan bills into law. To name only of a few of her achievements, she has signed historic voting rights legislation, upgraded our state's water infrastructure, made school lunches free, lowered the cost of college, signed common sense gun safety measures, protected LGBTQ rights, and as she promised in her first campaign, she fixed the damn roads by repairing over 20,000 lane miles. <laughs> Without a doubt, she's one of the best people to talk to tonight about getting things done. Moderating tonight's event is former governor of Oregon and current ILP Pritzker fellow, Kate Brown. Governor Brown has plenty of experience getting things done herself, having served in the Oregon State Legislature as Secretary of State and serving two terms as governor. I also want to briefly mention the next upcoming speaker series events. On this Friday at 12 p.m. in Ida Noyes, we'll be hosting University President Paul Alvisados and Rockefeller Foundation President Rajiv Shah for a discussion about leadership, optimism, and tackling big challenges. On October 26th at 5.30 p.m. in Ida Noyes, we'll be hosting former Attorney General Bill Barr to talk about his public service journey. For more info on upcoming events, you can visit the IOP website at politics.uchicago.edu. Lastly, as a reminder, please silence all cell phones. Now, without further ado, please join me once again welcoming Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It's a rap song called Big Gretch. <laughs> <laughs> and if all had worked out, Rhinefest would have wrapped it this afternoon, but his <laughs> schedule was too busy. Are you in the house, Rhinefest? He's, our new, he's one of our fellows this fall. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just delighted to see all of you, and we don't have a ton of time, so we are just going to dive right in. Uh, obviously, in order to get to be governor, you have to run for office, and campaigns can be tough, and they can be grueling, they can also be great fun. But my experience has been that candidates who are successful have to have fire in the belly. What's yours? Why do you run for office? Well, first, Kate, I'm so <laughs> glad to be with you, reunited with you, and I'm so glad to be here at the University of Chicago, See my friend David Axelrod, who I am so grateful for, and Heidi Heitkamp, some of the best leaders that we've seen in this nation in the recent history. Yeah. 
And you know, uh, when I first ran for office, I was 28 years old. Oh my God. And a lot of people said, you are too young, you gotta cut your teeth, you need to run for this office before you have credibility to run for another. And I ignored them all. Um, a, a trait which has served me well over the last few years, actually, <laughs> ignoring the noise. But, you know, I, um, I was someone who, when I got out of college, I took a job with the, the House Democrats in the Michigan Capitol and fell in love with public policy. I'd worked at the Michigan State AFL-CIO. My original plan was to be a sports broadcaster, but then I fell in love with public policy. And um, when, when the House went from Democratic control to Republican control, then I was a low, the lowest hire. <laughs> I knew my days were up, and so I, I went to, I'd put off law school for a little bit. I thought, this is my time to go to law school. I was practicing law. And in Michigan, we've got term limits. And my state representative could not run again. And someone called, like so many women, someone encouraged me to think about it. It never dawned on me to be the candidate. Um, but I l surveyed the field. I thought, I can do as good a job as any of these yahoos that are running. <laughs> and um, I ran it by both my folks. They were not married at the time, but each one of them was like, you would be a great state representative. So I started knocking doors. And during my first term, I became a member of the sandwich generation, meaning I was 30 years old. I had just given birth to my first child, and I was caring for my mom, who was dying of glioblastoma multiform, which is the worst kind of brain tumor you can get. And it was during that time that it really forged who I am today and why I think I've been able to figure out how to look five or 10 yards down the field. See, I still have the sports broadcaster in me. <laughs> five or 10 yards down the road instead of 100 and not get demoralized, not get overwhelmed, but focus on what needs to be done. And fighting to have child care for my baby, fighting my mom's insurance company who was wrongfully denying covering her chemotherapy, um, on top of other pressures that I was, I was navigating at the time, I think are exactly why I know this matters. I had a lot of advantages most people don't who have those same issues they're confronting, and that's why I do what I do. It's, we need government that sees people, that cares about people, that solves problems and makes life easier, and that's why I've got the fire, because I had you know, some, some abilities and some, some supports that most people don't, and I'm that's why I'm fighting so hard for everyone. And the joy of being governor is you can GSD, get yeah. stuff done. Get, that S is not for stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we all know what you're saying, Kate, and you're right. It's, I, I think that's why I love being governor, even on the hardest day, and we've had our share mm -hmm. over the last few years. Um, I see the results of my work. There's one quick example. In this last budget, we were able to get free breakfast and lunch for every one of the 1.4 million public school students in Michigan. Wow. Yes, and I talked to a super, I knew it would be great for families. I thought maybe little kids would benefit more. It's actually high schoolers and middle schoolers that we've seen the biggest change in because they didn't want to fill out the paperwork, the stigma of a free meal, and now all the kids are eating. And it's like the greatest thing that'll help our kids, you know, destigmatize, you know, food insecurity, but most importantly, make sure that they can learn while they're in the classroom instead of worrying about their, their grumbling stomach or where their next meal is gonna come from. And that's just one of the litany of things that I'm, I can see the work that I've done. That's why being governor is so great. That's fantastic, I love it. Okay, you did have the favorite campaign slogan of all time, at least for me, and that is, you're gonna fix the damn roads. Yeah. So I wanna find out, how, that, how is that going for you? <laughs> and this last year it was, we're fighting like hell. So if you swear, it can be a good thing, I guess, on occasion. <laughs> um, you know, when I was traveling the state, so when I decided to run for governor, I'd been out of office for a few years. I served for 14 years in the state legislature, in the House, six years, and in the Senate, eight years. And I was in the minority the whole time. I was the minority leader in the Senate. I got my teeth kicked in for 14 years. And I thought, you know, I've done my public service. I'm term limited. I'll go, I'll go back into the real world. And I was teaching both at the University of Michigan and Michigan State, which tells you I can bridge gaps. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we were, uh, but I think, and I was telling you this before we came out, being around students just reinvigorated my soul and gave me optimism and compassion, you know, the, the passion to run again. Um, but 
what I did was I spent two years traveling the state of Michigan. Now you're all in Illinois, you probably know what the shape of Michigan is, but just in case I'm pulling out my map, right? <laughs> Lower Peninsula, Upper Peninsula, I traveled all across the state, 83 counties, and I spent time in every one of them, even the reddest of the 83 counties, because I wanted to understand what people needed. I wanted to make sure that I focused on the things that mattered. And all over the state, people would say, I just want you to fix the damn roads. It's like, so I was at the um, Children's Hospital in Detroit, and I met a mom whose son was in the hospital, Mm -hmm. She had three other boys at home in Flint, driving up and down yeah. from Flint to Detroit. You know, a good 60 miles every Hour. single day. And um, I said, you know, if I'm elected governor, what could I do that would make the biggest difference in your life? And she thought for a second, she said, I just need you to fix the damn roads. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, your son's in the hospital and the roads are front and center. And she told me why. She was driving down from Flint down to Detroit, hit a pothole, and it busted the rim on her car. And so she was off the road for a whole day trying to get her car fixed. It was $1,000 worth of damage. So she missed that day seeing her son, had an unex un, you know, expected expenditure of $1,000, which was money from childcare or rent. And this was why number one on her list was fix the damn roads. And for me, it crystallized when the fundamentals are falling apart. It's people who are on the margins who are paying the worst price. If you can't drink the water coming out of your tap, some folks will just go out and buy bottled water. Others have no choice. If you hit a pothole like that, some people will drive their second car. Others will be stuck off the road and taking money out of rent or childcare just to get back moving again. If your public school's not working, some folks will just send their kid to another school or hire tutors. But if you're on the margins, you're, you're stuck. And I think that's why our focus on the roads has been so important. And we've made some headway. There's a lot of work to do. But the Biden-Harris infrastructure dollars have really supercharged the work that we're doing, and it's making a difference for people. A lot of money coming in that really makes a difference. Yes, ma'am. Okay, while we're on roads, uh, you brought up a number of issues that I want to talk to you about, but we only <laughs> have so much time. But while we're on roads, I want to talk about electric vehicles. So the West Coast, from my perspective, has done fairly well transitioning to electric vehicles. We don't have an auto man manufacturing industry. We have, uh, we have take great pride in our uh, progressive public policies about, around climate change and our gas prices are relatively high compared to the rest of the nation. Talk to me about how Michigan is transitioning to electric vehicles and what that looks like literally on the ground or I should say on the road. Well, <laughs> so I'm very pleased that um, we are seeing the American auto, you know, auto companies really putting forward, moving forward on the transition. Um, we were behind and they're moving quickly and le making, making great strides. We're working hard to build up the infrastructure, the charging infrastructure. We've landed, you know, one of the hydrogen hubs we were just announced as one of the places that's gonna be front and center in terms of work around hydrogen and, and other alternative solutions to, um, you know, an internal combustion engine and um, addressing climate change. But you know, I think that right now, obviously, uh, we have a, a strike happening in Michigan around trying to ensure that auto workers get a fair wage and the big three still remains competitive and um, around future change in automotive, you know, how we are building vehicles and, and protecting jobs for people. So there's a lot of flux right now, but I'm really proud of the work that we've done in terms of building up charging, incentivizing the transition, helping people understand why electric vehicles are gonna save them money in the long run. But I think that, you know, Michiganders are, we love our big trucks and <laughs> um, we're making, you know, we're adapting, but I, I think that it's a, a, it's a different climate. Um, and so our, the work that we're doing to lay the groundwork so people can have confidence and see the value, I think is really important. I tried to talk my security detail into electric vehicles and they weren't having any of it. So good <laughs> well, luck with that. We just redid um, the driveway at the residence. Okay. I want to talk about something controversial, redo a driveway. Um, and they, we built in some electric charging infrastructure. So whether it's a vehicle in my fleet or whomever comes after me, the 
state residents will be ready. That's fabulous. <laughs> Great news. Yep. So you also raised another issue um, that's uh, felt very personal to me. I had the experience of serving in the Oregon legislature in the minority for 14 years. And it was a huge sea change uh, when we were finally able to take the majority. And for you, uh, you've delivered a Democratic majority for the first time in 40 years in the great state of Michigan. Yeah, give her a round of applause. Huge. However, I'm guessing the political progressive community is chomping at the bit to move progressive public policy. And at the same time, you want to be able to maintain your majorities. How are you going to do that? <laughs> well, I'll just tell you this. So I told you the whole time I was in the legislature, I was in the minority and it was hard. And um, the fact that, you know, going into this last election and I'll just share with you, at this point in my re-election cycle, so 13 months out, everyone was writing my political obituary. There was no way she was going to get re-elected, that woman from Michigan who made hard decisions during the pandemic and, you know, midterm election of a president in the White House and that it was, you know, very bleak. And we worked our tails off and we were very successful. And not only did I win re-election, but almost by 11 points. What I never imagined was that our margin would be big enough to ensure that more Democrats were elected to the legislature. So at about two o'clock in the morning when I found out we took the state Senate, I was like, oh my gosh, I have one chamber that'll work with me instead of share stages with people who wanna kidnap and kill me. <laughs> I mean, we have to laugh, but it's pretty, pretty wild, right? Um, five o'clock in the morning, I got the text that we took the house to. And I didn't sleep for three days because I was just thinking about <laughs> all the things we've been fighting for my whole career, 20 years essentially, that now we were going to be able to get done. And so my message to the legislature after, after the election was, I don't want to hear anyone talk about a mandate. I don't want, no one should get, you know, full of themselves. We worked hard and this is um, a legitimacy of the, the, you know, substance on which we ran and now we've got to deliver. And so we've done a lot of really important things. We're also going to have to defend them. But one of the things I'm really proud of, I'm proud of a lot of things. I'll tell you a few of them. We signed, I signed the Crown Act, so there's no discrimination for someone who wears natural hair. I signed um, a law that eliminated the zombie laws that were on the books that threatened to come back and outlaw abortion under every circumstance. I signed common sense gun legislation, background checks, red flag laws, um, secure storage. I signed a billion dollar tax break for earned income, um, the earned income tax credit so working people with kids get a huge benefit as well as our senior citizens. And my most proud moment was we finally got Michigan on the right side of LGBTQ rights. My, my oldest daughter is a gay woman and I signed that law with my kids standing right next to me and I was really proud of that too. So. So we've done a lot of good things. We've been living our values, but we've also done a lot of really smart things as well that around our economy. I've paid down billions in state debt that was accrued before I became governor. We put a record amount in our rainy day fund. So in the event that there are ups and downs in the economy, we've got some, some ability to ensure that we're not cutting some things that, that are really important. We created a rainy day fund for our education system. So our school aid fund actually has a rainy day fund now for the first time. Our credit rating got upgraded since I've been governor. So I share this because while we've lived our values on quote unquote social issues, which I, they're always in, you know, linked with our economy, um, we've done a lot of really smart things that have put the state in a stronger position. And I think we've got to talk about both those things as we go in to defend this majority. It's also a one seat majority in both chambers. So in the Senate and in the House, it's a one seat majority, which is why if someone doesn't get to work, we're not in the majority. So now you know another reason I'm fixing those damn roads. <laughs> <laughs> no potholes keeping with those legislators away. <laughs> one seat majority, mm, that's not very much. Mm -hmm. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, your strategies around a progressive playbook that I think is a winning strategy, not only for the Midwest, 
but for all across the country. And you mentioned it, it has to do with the economy, but it also has to do with personal freedoms. I want to start specifically with the issue of choice. And uh, Michigan has sort of had sort of a convoluted history. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear a little bit about how you developed the legal strategy and then the political strategy around ensuring that women, that people have access to um, the reproductive health care that they need and deserve. Well, I appreciate the question, and I'm, I'm just going to rewind about 10 years. So in 2013, um, when I was the Senate Minority Leader, there was a debate on the Senate floor about requiring that women and our families pre-purchase an abortion rider in the event we might need an abortion one day. Whether it was a failed, desperately wanted pregnancy that didn't resolve itself, but required what we call a DNC, or it was selective reduction of IVF to improve the odds of conception, or it is an abortion in the traditional sense of what we think. And it was a debate that was happening. They never held a single hearing to hear from women. They never held a single hearing to hear from medical providers. And I was trying to put a human story to who was going to be impacted. As leader, I was trying to get one of my male colleagues to tell the story about his and his wife's experience trying to conceive and going through IVF and failing time and time again and needing to go to the hospital for an abortion procedure that was called something else. And um, he wasn't comfortable doing it. And I thought, how can I ask him to tell a story that is so raw if I'm not willing to tell my own? And so I went to the microphone and talked about how, for the first time publicly, that I had been raped when I was in college. It was not a planned speech. I actually, if you look at the video, I threw the speech off and I just went off the cuff. I hadn't planned to do that, but I was so mad that they weren't even listening to women. You know, I, I didn't change a single vote that day. The next morning, I was incredibly depressed. That night, I had to call my dad and tell him something that he was going to hear in the news that he did not know. And the next day, I went in, though, and as depressed as I was when I woke up, by the time I got there, the phones, the emails, I mean, people had shared similar stories. And so this is a fight that we've been waging in Michigan for a long time. Barrier after barrier has been erected. And so when Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed, I was very worried that we were going to go all the way back to 1931, which is when a law was put on the books in Michigan that outlawed abortion without any exceptions for rape or incest criminalized doctors and nurses. And so I filed a lawsuit um, before the Dobbs draft even was leaked. Mm. I filed a lawsuit and I took some heat for it. People said, oh, you're overreacting. How many women have been told that in your life, right? <laughs> you're overreacting, it's not ripe yet. This is unnecessary. And you have a very strong partner in your AG. I got a Maybe wonderful so. attorney general, Dana Nessel. And so I filed a lawsuit um, we got a stay when Dobbs did come out so that abortion was never illegal in Michigan. And then our partners at Planned Parenthood and the ACLU and an army of volunteers collected signatures across Michigan, and we put it on the ballot. And overwhelmingly, the people of Michigan voted to enshrine abortion rights in our Constitution. And earlier this year, I pulled out my pen and signed a law that repealed that 1931 zombie law so it can never come back to life. And we've got a bunch of trap laws that we're working to take off the books as well. Um, and so there are additional barriers, but it's, um, it's something that I think is, it's been minimized as a social issue for too long, but it's an economic issue, back to your question. On the trail, I would frequently get asked, oh, you're talking about abortion so much, shouldn't you talk about the economy? And I'm, I have a long patience, I am slow to boil, and I am pretty disciplined. I did not know that about you. <laughs> I'm a You're the frog. You're the frog in I the am. hot water. Okay. I'm, a, I'm, I'm a pretty disciplined messenger. But about the thousandth time I got that question, I was like, okay. I'm, if you don't think abortion is an economic issue, you probably don't have a uterus, right? <laughs> and I could see my communications team, their eyes bugged out when I said it. They said, well, I don't recall us talking about that answer. I'm like, oh, we didn't, but... It's true. The most consequential decision a, a person makes in their lifetime is when and whether to bear a child. a child. And so it is absolutely an economic decision. It is that ability that's get, gotten women the ability to participate in the workforce, right? 
So um, that literally changed in the last several decades, right, because of contraception. Absolutely. And, and all of that's at risk with the current United States Supreme Court that we have. All of that's at risk with but the potential of, of who's elected in next year's presidential and congressional elections. We can live in blue states. Fortunately, Michigan I can say that at the moment, but it's still a swing state. You can say that here in Illinois. But all of us could be impacted because of what happens at the federal level, and that's why now is not a time to disengage, but it is time to actually redouble our efforts. Democracy is a spectator sport. We, it is not a spectator sport. We gotta get in there and go. Right. Uh, and it's incredibly important. Did you do any work um, with your legislature around voting and election access? We did, and one of the things that I think was essential to our ability to flip both the House and Senate was a citizens initiative that um, was on the ballot in 2018, which took redistricting away from the legislature and put it into a bipartisan um, commission for the first time. So now the legislature couldn't gerrymand all of the districts. When I was governor my first term, I won by eight points, but we still had a massive Republican majority in our legislature because we were so gerrymandered. After this last election with fair districts, we actually, Michigan is a 50-50 state and it shows in my legislature, Democrats are in control by each chamber by one vote. So it's, it's very close, but it's much more reflective of the people of Michigan and that's why the redistricting reform was so crucial to our success, and that was a big part of the election rights that they codified at the ballot, but also we've done a lot more to make it easier for people to vote and to um, take part in elections. On campuses all across Michigan in this last election, students were standing in line because for the first time ever, you could register to vote on election day and vote on election day, and so students made the difference. <laughs> Right. As a former Secretary of State and as someone who won her first race by seven votes, I'm absolutely committed to voter <laughs> <Seven>. access. <laughs> and, and you know my Secretary of State is great, too, Jocelyn yes, Benson, yes, who yes. you work with. You have with. a very strong triumvirate, the three mm -hmm. of you, working together, supporting each other, having each other's backs. How did that develop? You know, each of us came to it in a different way. It was really interesting. And each one of us was told, you can't have too many women on the ballot. And each one of us ignored those, those comments. <laughs> Um, you know, as governor, you win a primary and earn your spot on the ballot. The Secretary of State and Attorney General in Michigan are nominated through convention oh, process. Did not know, and I did so not know that. We all we had different paths, and our senator, our U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow, was also on the ballot then. So it really was all women, which is why I picked Garland Gilchrist to be my, my running mate, because I thought we should have a man somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. He's fantastic. <laughs> So I want to go back to your strategy, um, your playbook for how Democrats win in the Midwest and frankly all across the country. And part of that is a very aggressive economic strategy. I know you can't share all of your secrets here, but can you talk a little bit about how you develop this strategy and what are your goals? Our strategy, or, I'm economic sorry, economic strategy. Yeah, okay. Well, I think you know our, our goal is to make sure, number one, that we continue to be in the pole position when it comes to all things auto, right? So we've got R&D, we've got the highest concentration of engineers per capita in the wow. country is in Michigan. We've got phenomenal institutions of higher education, a low cost of living and a high quality of life. Oh, and by the way, 21% of the world's fresh surface water, as you all know too, we <laughs> share it. Um, but I think that you know, that's important, but we've also made some great strides in terms of our um, life sciences corridor. And in the middle of the pandemic, we stole a headquarters from Florida to Michigan in Perigo in terms of um, medical uh, devices and, and, and medical products. They wanted to be in a state that likes science, go figure, right? <laughs> um, and so proud, proud of that. But um, when we all were desperately waiting for vaccines to roll out, all eyes were on Kalamazoo, Michigan, where um, Pfizer is located and the UPS and FedEx trucks that were pulling out with vaccines. So there's a lot of things in those spaces. We also have the second most diverse agriculture in the country after California. And that's another strength of Michigan with you know Michigan State University, which used to be called Michigan Agricultural College. Um, that's another thing that, that I think is 
a great strength for us, but also a tribute to why fresh water is so important for so many reasons. We can feed the world from the Midwest. Absolutely. Um, you have um, been through uh, a similar circumstances as I faced in Oregon. And on October 1st, 2015, uh, I got a phone call. I was driving downtown. My security detail was driving me downtown. And I received uh, a call from my public safety officer that there had been a shooting at Umpqua Community College in Southern Oregon. Um, it was devastating. Uh, the shooter had walked in and killed nine people, students, and a professor. And I will never forget that day. I know that unfortunately, in February of this year, you had a shooting at Michigan State. What went through your mind when you got that call? Well, you know, um, back up even a year, a year and, you know, four months before that, we had a shooting at Oxford High School and a student came in uh, with a weapon that his parent had bought for him and had not securely stored um, and, and shot and killed um, four of his classmates and shot and hurt a lot more. And so when the Michigan State shooting happened, I hate to say that I, you know, had been through it with, with Oxford, although nothing prepares you for it and nothing can ever, um, I think, protect you from feeling all the emotions that everyone feels. It's, it's, hor it's the worst thing in the world because you do this, you've done this work at, for the same reasons that I do, because we care about people. Mm -hmm. We want to help people. And there's nothing you can say to a parent who's lost their child to a school shooting that will ease their burden, even, even a tiny bit. Um, so I think that those, of all the hard days, those were without question, you know, some of the, the, the hardest. I immediately um, got in touch with Dan Malloy, our colleague who was the governor in Connecticut during Sandy Hook. It was my first phone call, and he gave me some great advice, which was show up, just keep showing up. Don't ever talk about yourself and how you feel about it. Talk about the families, and do not focus on what needs to be done policy-wise. Be there to grieve, and then save that for the next conversation. And I thought those were really good pieces of advice. But, um, you know, the, in this country and only in this country, guns are the number one killer of children. And we've let that happen. And that's why, you know, getting some of those common sense safety measures done was important, but it doesn't fix the problem. It doesn't ensure it doesn't happen again, but maybe it can keep it um, it maybe can mitigate the likelihood, and, and that's the best we can do in this moment. But at the federal level, we, I think, as a country, need to grapple with this and get our priorities straight. And we deserve, at least from my perspective, a national assault weapons ban. This country deserves it. Our children deserve it. Our schools deserve it. Our places of worship deserve mm -hmm. it. Thank you. So I want to talk. Um, uh, about another issue that you had to deal with um, during your time as governor. Um, it was not an easy time for governors across the country and governors were truly on the, first on the front lines. Um, we were literally building the airplane while we were in the air during the pandemic. Many of us, uh, out of concern for our children, our educators, our vulnerable families, closed schools um, for many months. Uh, we are seeing the data now um, very clear that the impacts of those school closures are both uh, long-term and far-reaching, and I'm sure many of the students in here were impacted by it. Have you, would you think differently about those policies now? How would you uh, assess um, your policies around school closure, given the data that we now have? Well, I'll start with this. You know, if any thinking person who is being honest could go back in a time machine and do some things differently. We all would, right? Um, as we look, as we've learned about COVID and who truly is vulnerable, that might have changed some of our calculations. I was building the plane while I was flying it, just we're all, as were all the governors, without any help. In fact, with the federal government not just not helping us, but working against us in some regards. Um, 
the experts that I was listening to were University of Michigan, some of the finest scientists there are. And I convened a group of Midwestern governors to talk regularly, to share information, help troubleshoot where we, where we could help one another. And so it was me and Governor Pritzker, as well as Governor Walls from Minnesota, Evers from Wisconsin, Eric Holcomb from Indiana, and Mike DeWine from Ohio, so bipartisan group. And we even adopted Andy Bashir from Kentucky. He's not really Midwest, but <laughs> I'm like, isn't he Southern? I figured he could use some help too. Um, but when we were sharing, sharing data, sharing um, the counsel that we were getting, when, I, when JB was speaking, I was getting the benefit of Northwestern, who was advising him, and he was getting the benefit of University of Michigan. When Mike DeWine was speaking, we had the Cleveland Clinic expertise, Walls, Mayo Clinic. So we had some of the best um, minds advising each of us, and, and we helped one another. And, but I, I'll say this, our scientists can tell us what happened the last time we had a pandemic. In 1918, kids died overwhelmingly. It was young people that were killed by the influ Spanish flu that took over the globe. And as a mom, as a governor, that was front and center for a lot of the decisions that we were making, especially around schools, that I couldn't imagine a worse scenario where we lost an overwhelming number of, of children and young people. And that's, I think, one of the things that informed a lot of our decisions to pull kids out of school. Um, so, you know, you can get the facts, understand as much as you can about an unknowable situation and make the best decision that you can with the values that you were elected on. And that's, that's what, what I think we all tried to do. It was um, during one of our group conversations with that group where did you do it by phone or by text? We were all on the phones. Okay. We were on the phone. We scheduled, you know, I'm, Mike DeWine might know how to text, but I'm not confident. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but we, we um, I, th I think that, you know, it was those conversations that gave me confidence to make the hard decisions because we were all doing the same thing. And, and one of the governors said, you know, Gretchen, you're doing the same thing that the rest of us are doing, but you take so much more heat for it. Why is that? And then after the last word landed, he said, oh, don't answer that, I know. It's, you're the only woman on this call, and you're, you're getting attacked more than any of us. But we were all doing many of the same things at the same time. Um, and I found the same thing happened on the West Coast. Yep. I was the only female governor at the time on the West Coast. We were, I had actually texted Governor Newsom to say, hey, let's work together. Amazing concept. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a lot of heat. Yep. But we did the right thing, we saved lives. And we made sure that people got the health care that they needed. Do you feel the same way like for the decisions that you had to make when you made them? And Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I know the numbers in Oregon. I don't know the numbers in Michigan. If we'd been the average state, 5,000 more people would have died. Yep. That's, what that's the a lot of people. Yep. That's what studies have, have shown in Michigan as well. So I don't regret saving those lives. Good. One of the joys of being governor is that you get to work with the whole state. And um, I like to think that governors are very pragmatic because we want a GSD. Not stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I really struggled though in working with my rural counterparts, my Republican conservative counterparts. And I think it was because of the social justice agenda I was advancing. Could you talk a little bit about your strategy? I know you've pledged to work with anyone, mm -hmm. regardless of their political affiliation. Um, how are you bridging this divide? How are you closing the urban-rural gap? Well, we're, we're very intentional about it. I think the hardest part of the pandemic was not connecting with people. That's where I get energy. That's where I get information. That's what helps keep me focused on what really matters is by talking to people and asking them what's important, what can I do? Let me guess, you're an extrovert. A little bit. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and, but, so we, we did round tables. Um, we tried to do Zoom calls with people during the pandemic, different groups of people so I could understand what they were struggling with, what was going on, what we could do. Um, but you know, I'll never forget having a round table in um, Midland, Michigan. Midland is one of the most conservative parts of the mm. state. And it was with farmers, one of the more conservative stakeholders in the state. And it was the greatest conversation. They shared, you know, some of the some of the ways that they had felt the rhetoric had changed. 
One of them is talking about driving a combine down the road, a, a two-lane road, um, and you know th that people just had were no had no patience. People would just flip off the the farmer who's driving a combine, trying to you know do what he can to survive and take care of their family, and um, their their frustration about you know the rhetoric and how people are treating each other and. Some of the feedback I've gotten from red, you know, redder counties was, we want to have one point of contact for rural, for rural communities so that we can help get help navigating state government. So we created the Office of Rural Development. Um, we put more resources into transportation for school districts that have to transport kids further. Those are more An hour rural on the communities, bus, right? right? So th whether it's building out broadband or strategic population growth or trying to land economic development in communities that need jobs and, and need people. All of these things, I think, have been informed by those conversations, and that's why they're so important to have and, and to listen. You know, I often hear politicians say, I was talking to so-and-so, I was talking to so-and-so, and I said, you should be listening to so-and-so. You're, you're not, you know, you're not learning if you're the one talking. <laughs> Good advice. All right, we're supposed to move to- Says the woman who's been talking for 25 yes. minutes. Yes. Great. <laughs> we're supposed to move to student questions, so I'm just gonna pop this in really quickly. Climate change. The Midwest has suffered this summer from smoke and wildfire. This is something the West is very familiar with. I know you've had flooding. I know you've had crazy climate events. What are your strategies to tackle climate change in your state, and how are you convincing those who don't might not necessarily agree with you that you need to take action? So a couple of things. So, I mean, we've set some really aggressive standards. People are surprised they're coming out of Michigan and we're, we're getting it done and we're, we're making progress. I'm happy about that. You know, um, you and JB, by the way, too. Yeah. I mean, wow. We're, we're all looking at each other and setting the bar and trying to, you know, outdo one another, which is a good thing. I should say Governor Pritzker. He was here <laughs> last week. Yeah. Um, and, but, you know, the summer was hard with all the Canadian smoke. I mean, we felt the reality of what's happening when, you know, with, with what's happening in climate and what it means. I also know that for economic development, as we talk to companies, they are insisting on green energy, you know, clean energy. And so that's a part of the conversation that I have with more conservative interests who maybe aren't there on, on the climate mitigation steps um, to say, if we want to be competitive, we have to be able to offer clean energy. We have to have stability. Um, we've got a powerful story to tell here in the Midwest. Uh, you know, like I said, a, a low cost of living, it's about a tenth of what it is in the Bay Area in California. Um, we've got a, a high standard of living, a high quality of life with 21% of the world's fresh water, which you know, is, is such a unique and important asset, but also important responsibility of ours. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm smiling because I'm biking everywhere here and it's really flat, so it's very easy to bike. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Flatness, I didn't add that to the list of, <laughs> of assets we have, but uh, I, I think that you know, all of these um, are important aspects to being competitive, to growing a population, to looking to the future of the economy, to drawing in talent and keeping talent. All of these things are really important, as well as being a state where all people are respected and protected under the law. I think is going to be a long-term great asset for many of the states, especially in the Midwest, that have codified those rights. Thank you. We are going to turn it over to the famous student questions. Okay. Down here. Okay. Thank you. Um, Governor, how should governors and mayors balance the desire for leniency and even decriminalization of shoplifting, public drug use, camping on the sidewalks, things like that, with the desire for public safety and law and order? So, you know, like, like so many things, um, I, I just recoil when I hear, you know, a, a, what I hear is a false choice, right? That we can both be safe communities and afford people um, dignity and paths to prosperity. You know, here in Illinois, Chicago in particular, I know that you're grappling with a lot of the convergence of a, of a lot of policies that you don't have control over, but that are um, you're living with. And so I don't come from a state where we are yet confronting many of those same pressures. So I don't know that I'm a, a great expert to um, answer this question, but I would just say, 
You know, I, I think that it is important that we have safe communities, that we create paths to prosperity for every person, no matter who they are, where they come from. And um, I would love to see our nation uh, afford people the opportunity to work once they are here. I think that that is a, a piece of the solution, but I, um, I, I hesitate to talk beyond that because um, I've, it's not something that we've had to confront like I know that you have. And so for me to advise, I, I feel like would be foolish. Um, population and medium family incomes have declined um, while you've been governor. What, uh, why is that and what can you do to reverse this trend? Well, one of the things I, I will acknowledge is Michigan's population is, has grown, but not as fast as other states. And so we have lost a congressional seat. One of the things that we've seen over decades is this continual slide in, in Michigan. We have an older population, and it is something that um, I think is, is a long-term, very important challenge that we've got to start getting a hold on right now. So one of the things that I've done is create a Growing Michigan Together Council. It is populated by people on both sides of the aisle with expertise in terms of placemaking, improving educational outcomes, and um, building up the infrastructure that's gonna be necessary to support population growth. We know that with climate change, not that it's an upside by any stretch of the, of the you know, thought process, but with climate change, people are gonna be moving to the Midwest. You are probably already seeing it to some extent as we are seeing coastline be bought up in the state of Michigan all across the state. Um, but that's not a strategy for population growth. We need a strategy now for strategic population growth. And so this will not be solved in the next three years. While I'm governor, I'll be done in three years. But it's got to get started now, and it has to transcend a change in, in leadership, a change in administration. And so this work is underway. We are, are going to have a blueprint by the end of this calendar year, and we're going to move forward on it. Some of it is codifying fundamental human rights that Americans, and especially Amer you know, young people in America expect. We've made great strides, and I think that's gonna be a huge asset for us going forward. And another is ensuring that we've got the housing options, which is why we're putting so, many, so much resources into affordable housing and building up our housing stock and upgrading housing stock in Michigan, as well as all of the other important quality of life factors that talent is looking for. So these are all important aspects, uh, but I think that you know, it, this didn't happen overnight. It won't be fixed overnight, but I think we're laying the groundwork for, for long-term growth. And I think that's important, both in our economy and in our population. And pivoting off um, a related student question, um, I'll kind of put them together. Are any of those strategies specifically aimed at young people? Because obviously those are the most important people you want to come and stay in the state. Yes. Absolutely. And so um, I would you know, acknowledge all the things that we've done to lower the cost of a higher education in Michigan. I would acknowledge all of the fundamental rights that we have codified. I know that young people expect all people to be protected and respected under the law, that they expect to be able to make their own decisions about their bodies. Um, they expect a state to be good stewards of our, our environment and climate. And so all of these, I think, are, are pieces that are informed by young Michiganders and people that we're hoping to, to lure or lure back to the state of Michigan. Um, okay. You are a staunch sub abortion supporter enshrining abortion rights into the Michigan State Constitution and repealing a law that banned abortion in Michigan and appealed legislation that required health and safety inspections at abortion clinics. More recently, you signed into legislation um, a law that undermines conscious protection for employees, employers who object to the moral horrors of abortion. Do you truly believe that employers should be forced to stomach this? I think that so many employers in Michigan recognize that having policies that um, limit the ability of 52% of the population to make their own decisions about their bodies are, will have a chilling effect on our ability to lure talent into Michigan. Um, we've not, I, I think one of the things that we don't do in Michigan is um, vilify and challenge big employers like that one guy down in that one peninsula state <laughs> way down south has done. Um, and I, I think that those are, those are important things. We've gotten a lot of support out of the business community 
forward these policies because they recognize it makes Michigan more competitive and Michigan a more palatable and attractive state to um, the talent that they're, that they're so desperately looking for. So in that, you're suggesting that progressive policies are, in fact, a, um, a business building uh, strategy? If it, is that what you're saying? I'm saying bigotry is bad for business, and business understands that, too. <laughs> nice. Um, Who is this student? Why does she get all the questions? <laughs> I'll, I'll take the blame for the follow-up. Um, <laughs> We've been watching with horror the events unfolding first in Israel, now in Gaza. Mm. You govern a state with among the largest Arab populations in the country. How are you thinking about um, protecting citizens from increases in both Islamophobia and anti-Semitism that uh, we're seeing well documented in all the states? Yeah. It's really hard. I'm just going to be blunt. Um, you know, I think that the, that the, the terrorism that occurred in, in Israel is and the images coming out are so sad and disturbing. I'll say that images of civilian Palestinians who have been um, killed or are grieving, you know, the, the death of their loved ones are as well. And um, you can stand with Israel, which, which I do, proud to, but also recognize that there are innocent civilian Palestinians who are being hurt and killed and um, and recognize that, that that is a heartbreaking situation as well. And that's why we've, we're working so hard to I talk with uh, our Jewish leaders as well as our imams to make sure that I am staying connected to the communities. But I think it's important to acknowledge that I, I, I do believe that Israel has a, a right to respond. Um, but I worry about all of the innocent lives that are being um, lost from, from both communities. How are you received with those messages when you go out into the communities? Everyone's mad. Mm -hmm. That's just honest. And, and I think that that's reasonable, but um, I'm gonna continue to keep an open line of dialogue with uh, all the people of Michigan. And I'm gonna do everything I can to help Michiganders who are still in the region trying to get home to get home. So, um, Governor, you're proudly pro-labor. What um, does the UAW strike mean for you and your state? Well, <laughs> it's hard. It's really hard. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the UAW has gotten a lot of really um, great terms on the table. I'm hoping that the strike can conclude soon. I think we've laid the groundwork for real growth in our economy and continued leadership when it comes to mobility and this, you know, generational transition that is happening. Michigan is the state that um, will hurt the most the, the longer the strike goes. And while I keep an open line of dialogue with the leaders of the big three and the head of the UAW, as the governor of Michigan, um, I, I want them to get a good deal and to get it done soon. Does this feel like whatever the outcome of the strike is, does this feel like a new era in labor to you? It does, it does, you know, we have seen over the last few years and the pandemic was a part of that, that um, Americans value the right to join voices and to negotiate for good terms, time off, good protections with a job. And so I do think that we are seen more people looking to unions, more people interested in joining unions, and um, unions, you know, getting better terms for their members because of this, the support that people have been, been you know, um, lending. Because this is definitely the, one of the more aggressive <laughs> heads of the UAW that we've seen probably in a generation. Is that kind of your observation? Uh, yes. You know, I've, I've gotten to know Sean Fain a bit. Um, we've you know, I've shared, had conversations with him pretty regularly since he became the new president of the UAW. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful that, you know, they do lock in these good terms and, and you know, deliver for their members and get people back to work. Um, do you think that the legislature in Michigan will continue to be fairly progressive? Or do you think that that, that last election was sort of a fluke? 
I don't think it was a fluke, but I think that elections are always going to be close in Michigan and with fairly drawn seats. I think that the legislature could go a couple seats one way or a couple seats the other way, but I don't think we'll see super majorities again because we won't be gerrymandered the way that we have been for the last 40 years. Um, and you, you talked about this with the governor before about um, making way for Democrats in a purple state. Um, a student asked, are there any crucial ways you, um, you shifted that you see have potential for replication? I'm, I don't, can you are there crucial ways that you, um, that you shifted your own state that you think have uh, potential replication in other states, things that you've done? Oh, well, you know, I, it's so funny. I was in um, Minnesota this past weekend, and uh, Tim Walls, our, our friends and uh, colleague, um, they also have a trifecta in Minnesota, and they have been leading with their values, and it's fun to kind of compete with one <laughs> another because we're doing a lot of the, the same Things. But I, I do think that um, fairly drawn districts, the real focus on reproductive rights and being incredibly um, and uniquely, in my time in, in elective office, organized from the top of the ticket all the way down was really important. And having the resources. One of the things that I always forget to mention with all the other stuff we've had to navigate a plot to kidnap and kill me, the pandemic, um, floods, mm, you know, nice. school shootings. Another was 32 recall attempts against me in my first term as governor. It was not fun. I do not recommend it. But <laughs> if there was a silver lining, it was that during that period of time, I could raise resources in excess of what I ordinarily would under the campaign finance law in Michigan. And so I did. I leveraged the opportunity. I raised about $3 million in excess of what I ordinarily would have been able to raise. The other side didn't really think that through when they waged all these recalls. Um, after the recall period closed, I couldn't keep that money in my, in my candidate account, so I gave it to the Democratic Party, and we built up our apparatus to run. And so I think that was an important part of it well. Uh, having resources, having you know, unprecedented collaboration, a very clear difference on reproductive rights that was on the ballot as well and fairly drawn districts. Um, so I do think it can be replicated, uh, but I think that you know all of those were really incredibly important ingredients to, to what, we, what we were able to do. And you just, you just offered a laundry list of difficulties. I would just ask, and not being cheeky, I'm asking this serious question, of all those, which one was the most challenging for you? I, th I think that the threats, um, you know, I'll just say any time the former president even mentioned Michigan on Twitter, I got more death threats. Come to Michigan and say, lock her up, I get more death threats. Mm -hmm. um, call me that woman from Michigan, more death threats. And um, while I, I never personally was fearful at any point that I, I might not live through my time as governor, I'm a different person today because of it. I love people. I would love to walk in anywhere across the state, and I just don't feel comfortable doing it anymore. And um, my family's been through a lot. My husband, who's a dentist, he's just this geeky dentist, <laughs> had planned to practice dentistry for about eight more years, you know, and, and then retire. And the threats against me started spilling over to his office. He was getting threats at the office. His staff was scared. He was worried that one of his patients might get hurt. So he decided to retire. And, you know, my kids are, you know, fortunately, you know, we're all healthy, well, pretty well adjusted. Um, but I think that that experience is something that I, I never could have contemplated when I ran for governor. It's a part of my reality to this day. And, um, I, I, I think that's been something that's really, it hasn't fundamentally changed who I am or what I do, and I'm not scared, and I stand my ground, but, but it's there. Well, let's end on a, a cheerful note, because um, I, I do think there has been a chilling of people wanting to run for public office in light of what you've just described. So how do you tell this room for all of mostly young people um, how, uh, how they should feel uplifted and want to run for public office and want to have a... Uh... <laughs> 
<laughs> there are a lot of young people here, many at heart. 20 seconds. Many at heart. Okay. How, do you, how do you uplift them into wishing to serve uh, the public? <laughs> So the young people in this country have the most power in this country if you use it at the ballot box to change this, to lock in reproductive rights, to lock in civil rights, to ensure that you've got leaders who care about climate change and make sure that you've got a planet on which you can live and do whatever path you want in your life. It all stems from that ballot box. And so that's why it's about making sure that you not just participate, but those of you who think you might want to run, run. Don't let some artificial barrier stand in your way. Don't tell yourself you've got to hit this certain degree or this point in life or run for this smaller office. Ignore the noise. This generation is the boldest, gives me the most optimism, and I'm counting on you to run, which is why I do what I do to fight back so that it's a safer, more humane place, but you're going to have to finish the job, and I can't wait to vote for you. <laughs> This is an amazing city. Uh, you could be anywhere tonight in the great city of Chicago. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. To all the students, study hard, get registered to vote, vote, and then run for office, get a job first. And <laughs> can we please thank that amazing woman from Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Thank you.